So, yes, Lord, we come to worship you and we praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. Oh 
Those things we bring to mind in worship when we're thankful, when we're thankful for all you've done, or we, we recognise the, the things that lay heavy on our heart. And we thank you that we can bring all we are before you in worship. And we thank you that, you know, those parts of ourselves we want to hide away and feel ashamed of, that you look upon us and you say that we should no longer be ashamed, that we are forgiven that we are part of your family and that we are known by you and we are loved by you. So we bless what you're doing amongst us this morning and, and we pray that as this morning continues that you would continue to minister to us as we surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys. Have a seat. So, um, before we let the kids go and sign into their group and make a start on the sneaky chocolates that we've left them, um, we've got a few quick notices. Uh, our first one is uh, just a heads up again that um, some of the small groups have been kind of catching up over September, but we're going to kind of relaunch in October. So, look out for that. We're going to send you an email out, send you information about what's going on, stick it up on the website. So keep an eye out for that one. And next, also uh, a reminder again, uh, it's trouble times. I'm guessing probably all of us are um, feeling the impacts of the cost of living and, and everything else that hits upon us. But we recognize that there are also many who are um, struggling in need and making use of the food banks far more than they should do. Uh, we are so thankful there is a food bank available for these people, but we wish there wasn't one. We wish there was no need. But until that need has been eradicated, then um, if you are able to, um, maybe just stick a couple of other items in your basket when you go shopping this week and bring them on on Sunday. We've got that basket out in the foyer. Please do um, see if you're able to add something for those who are maybe struggling as much or more than maybe we are. So uh, we would love you to do that. Thank you. It's part of our worship part of our giving, part of blessing God as we bless others. And next, we have, uh, yes, we have a Kingdom Impact Day. So this is, um, we are so pleased that we are able to rejoin, meet together again as Vineyard Churches across the, the North East and Yorkshire. Um, so uh, many churches are coming together. We're meeting in York on the 29th of October. It's 9.30 to 4pm. It's free. Um, we would love you if you Count yourself as a leader or somebody who loves to get stuck in, please do come along. Um, it's 
The main um, talk is going to be by the Faraday Institute, Science of Faith Hand in Hand. It's looking really interesting. I guess it's one of those ones where sometimes people avoid those conversations with our friends and we think almost like science and faith have um, no meeting point. But for many of us, we believe that actually science and faith work together. It's the world God created. The science is looking at his creation and working out how it works and faith brings some of that why into the how. And we love that mixture of the two together. And maybe you've got a friend who probably has some of those conversations with you to do about your depth, maybe this might be helpful. Um, so that's kind of the main talk bit, but actually we know that the main focus is once again meeting together, part of a wider network of churches, knowing that we are part of this being other movement and getting to know some people, getting to build friendships again with those guys. Maybe there'll be some people from York that when those of us, we used to go in the early days, we used to go to York, we can go and catch up with them again. Um, and our friends from Leeds and from Tyneside and further beyond as well. So uh, we would really recommend you come along to that. Um, you can sign up. There's a link on the website to sign up or have a word with me afterwards. And we'll give you some more information and send out an email to let you know what's going on. Do we have anything else? No, we don't. So uh, we're going to take a quick two-minute break for the kids to go and get signed in. And for those of you that are feeling a little sleepy to top up the coffee, grab a snack, help us out with eating the donuts. And then we'll be back here to listen to Emma. Thanks very much. Oh, Matt. Good. <laughs> Hi, just to introduce myself, because there's quite a lot of new people here today. Um, my name's Emma, um, Emma Claridge, and I'm part of the teaching team, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> I occasionally teach, <laughs> probably three or four times a year, along with um, Steve and Nick and Maggie. Um, so I just wanted to start with prayer, because I always forget to do that, and I'm halfway through my talk, and I think, oh yeah. I haven't actually prayed to hope that my random words make some sense to everybody. <laughs> uh, so if we just start with a prayer. Lord, I just ask that this morning our hearts will be open to what you want to tell us individually. I pray that what I talk about makes some sense to people and that they kind of can take something back with them, something touches them, um, even if it's not an exact topic that they're struggling with, but if, if there's just something in the words that I've spoken today, I just pray that they will sit in people's hearts um, and change people, and that's what you want to do. And I just wanted to pray that you'll be lifted high and higher in our lives than where you probably sit at the moment, um, and you want to be up there looking down on us and you don't want to be at the same level so you know you want to be up there and you're above all our situations and all our lives so i pray that we'll help um you'll help us remember that amen um okay so today i'm talking about nehemiah 5 so we've been going through the book of nehemiah if you've been following the last few weeks um so nick spoke last week about the difficulties that nehemiah faced while surrounded by the rubble of the walls. So Nehemiah must have felt really frustrated and exasperated by the attempts to build um, the temple, rebuild the temple, and quite frankly, exhausted after all these external threats coming in and all the difficulties that he's gone through. He must have finally thought, okay, we're on a, you know, things are sorted now, we're on a good, we're on a roll. So chapter 4 finished on, on a note of great victory, really. The people were doing the work of God, building the wall, and they were doing it all despite all the obstacles. So I don't know if you've ever watched Grand Designs. <laughs> this really reminded me. Um, reading Nehemiah really reminded me of this programme. So I was watching an episode recently where a couple were working on this amazing, massive project to build their dream house, which was massive, you know, it's one of these super duper houses. <laughs> and it was just, everything was going wrong. It was like they had a team of um, Latvian workers, I think, turn up, and they were like putting all their hopes in these workers to do all this amazing job for like, you know, peanuts or something. <laughs> and then they were like turned up for two days, did half a job, and then went away and weren't to be found again with all, and went with all the money. So they were basically in a right mess, and it took them, spent tons more money than they had to, um, Everything just went wrong, really. One thing after another. You know, you, you watch these programmes and it's like ill health and then it's COVID and then it's, you know, it's, it must just be one thing after another. And 
you know, when COVID hit for them, it meant no money was coming in, so they weren't earning any money. Um, costs escalated because all building costs went up. <laughs> so it was just like this absolute catastrophe. But it did, it did happen in the end, because these people seem to somehow managed to find like a million pounds. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we just found an extra 500 grounds, so it's like, okay. <laughs> Um, so this week we're continuing the story of Nehemiah by looking at chapter 5, which is saying, which specifically looks at how Nehemiah dealt with internal strife and unrest within his own community and also how he dealt with injustice. I think out of all these chapters in Nehemiah that this one shows us Nehemiah's true integrity and how he put God first in his life. So we've got um, up on the slide now. Here we have them. That's it. Yeah, sorry. thought that was a random slide there. <laughs> um, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to stay, eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our home to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we were of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, sorry, I don't need to move it off. Sorry. Um, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. Um, so, interestingly in this chapter, um, this is a bit of a side note really, um, there's no mention of working on the wall, indicating perhaps that the work had stopped. Um, I'm wondering whether these issues that were going on amongst people were causing the work to stop, because it was pretty major things really. Um, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever had conflict with somebody, whether it's in a relationship, a family relationship, a romantic relationship, at work, it feels impossible to be motivated in planning ahead if it's a work issue, or it affects your ability to be motivated and focused on the end goals. You just feel like giving up, really. So I can imagine people would have just down sticks and thought, what's the point, you know, <laughs> this is going off. And it's actually massively affecting, if it's affecting your personal life, it's very hard to give everything to what you're doing. So it must have been very frustrating for Nehemiah to have got so far with everybody at this stage, only for things to topple due to this injustice and greed that was evident, which ultimately led to a lack of unity, discontent and bitterness amongst his workers. So these verses here show that the rich Jews, um, who were being greedy, I was gonna say a tricky word there, but I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> Covetousness. <laughs> I was like trying to practice before on covetousness and insensitivity in a time of famine. So just to give a bit of context, there was a serious economic and financial crisis going on at the time of building this wall, as many of the workers had been labouring for so long on the wall, and so there was less people available to help the harvest. And so many of the Jews were being oppressed by the rich Jews. They had no choice but to borrow off them, and the rich Jews were then using this to their advantage. So saying basically, if you sell me your house, I'll give you food, and if I'll, I'll lend you money for high interest rates. And if you can't pay the loan, I'll take your children as collateral, which, you know, slavery, basically. So debt in Nehemiah's time just didn't mean calls from bill collectors. It actually meant people selling children into slavery to make interest payments and to make ends meet. So, some brave people, I mean, they were brave really to come to Nehemiah about this, because they must have felt that, you know, Nehemiah's had to deal with quite a lot of stuff, really, and then to come to him with these issues. Um, but, you know, quite rightly, they felt that, you know, their fellow Jews were charging them interest and exploiting them. This wasn't just unfair and unjust, but it was actually a clear violation of God's law, laid out in Deuteronomy 23. 19 to 20. So it says, do not charge a fellow, fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a fellow Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put, 
your hand to in the land you are entering to profess. So it's specifically laid out for them that they weren't to do that. And they certainly weren't to enslave each other. That was something specifically, you know, not a good thing to do. So the timing, the timing could not have been worse. The walls were so close to being built. And in some ways, it's quite easy to rally up against external enemies. You know, all together, you kind of all, let's get together and like fight against the external enemies that we were talking about last week. But internal conflicts are destructive and fester away. And in, in this case, actually building internal walls within relationships, you know, they're actually, not only it's building, you know, they were building a physical wall, but it was actually causing internal walls to be built within their relationships. Um, so the Jewish people were very brave to confront with the honesty of the situation and very measured words, considering how badly they were being mistreated. So we're now going to look at how Nehemiah responds. So he said, when I heard their outcry in these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, where are we? <laughs> Is it the right side? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, it's hard to tell them. Um, so I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought, your, bought our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Sorry, I don't know when it's the next slide. <laughs> Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine and olive oil. We will give it back, they said. <coughs> and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep his promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, the whole assembly said, Amen, praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So amazing, really, their response. <laughs> it's like, yep, yeah, done wrong, great. You know, they're very quick to like, which I don't know if it's as simple as that, but it was quite simple. Um, you're doing slides now, unfortunately. <laughs> Great. It's <laughs> one of the things to think about. <laughs> um, so coming from my previous background, prior to what I do now, I was working in business and managerial work, really, for quite a number of years. And there was always countless books on managing conflicts. It's always one of those things that you could, you know, multiple books on it. <laughs> um, and I did find the following quotes on a, a website about employee conflict which says, managing conflict can be a tricky thing, especially when you are not familiar with the larger ecosystem in which the particular individual or department creating the conflict operates and how efforts to resolve conflict will reverberate throughout that ecosystem. The workplace is fueled with so many concurrent agendas that you'll never know which ones may be affected when you resolve conflict solely to benefit and advance your own. So the, the, the larger ecosystem which we talk about in that quote is really the other things going off externally around, you know, which the, the boss may or may not be aware of. Um, so I think it's really, it's quite an interesting quote because they're saying that it's so hard to do if you're just purely trying to advance your own, your own agenda and you're just doing it purely for you. Now, Nehemiah actually, had a really good understanding about what the ecosystem was surrounding his people. He was well aware of the tensions and the difficulties that were being caused by the tensions within the land once it had been brought to his attention. And he had to prove that he was not doing this for his own, great, his own gain or notoriety and was actually acting for the common good and standing for everybody. And he was acting as a godly man. 
In the same article that I was reading, it says that good leaders need to act responsibly to be respected. Um, you know, acting responsibly, how do you do that? You need to make yourself vulnerable, potentially unpopular, and not be overwhelmed by their own insecurities. And I think this is what Nehemiah shows, really, in the way he is. So there's a number of points about how Nehemiah dealt with this conflict. So he sought to bring restoration to the situation immediately by gathering the people together, finding out what the situation is. It would have been quite easy for him to just ignore it and concentrate on all being built and just hope that they just sort it out themselves. And getting involved could have cost him personally and could have brought much pressure on him. Um, and it wasn't an easy or simple, straightforward issue to resolve. He knew that an unhappy workforce would not lead to success. He knew that God was a God of peace. In 1 Corinthians it says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregation of the Lord's people. He also got very angry. Now people struggle a bit with this thing, with anger. I think that a godly person can't be angry. But he had that righteous anger and passion within him, within him to which drove him to resolve the issue. And that's when it's the kind of righteous anger which is different to normal anger. Jesus demonstrated this when he overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple. So it was something that Jesus demonstrated as well. Um, and Nehemiah pondered the situation in his mind, it says in Nehemiah 5 verse 7. He didn't respond immediately. In James 1 verse 19 it says, everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry. He made an explicit accusation to the nobles. He said, you are charging your own people interest. What you're doing is not right. So he wasn't vague. He wasn't kind of fluffing around the subject. He was straight to the point. He exposed the inaccuracies and the inconsistent behavior of the Jews. They were enslaving the fellow Jews. He wasn't vague about it and he got straight to the problem. Nehemiah was not afraid of upsetting people, even those he had to keep on board. He was brave and courageous. He also went on to spell out more about what needed to change, what needed to, to, to right the wrong, stop charging interest, give back to them immediately their fields, olive groves, houses, and also the interest he charged them. So he's very like, specific and detailed. And he also asked them to repent and to return all property and interest charged. So he didn't just leave it to sort them out themselves. He dealt with this internal conflict very seriously, took their grievances seriously and showed that he had care and compassion for those in need around him. And interestingly, after this was dealt with, the wall was built very, very quickly in just over 50 days. All this builds up to it. It's like, you must have thought, you know, is this never gonna end? You know, it's, um, they were so close to the end that they couldn't see it. Yet yeah, he stood firm and had the capacity within him to deal with this. Even though I think I'd have just thought, oh, this is just one other thing, it's like another thing that's happening. Here we go again. <laughs> um, so in Nehemiah 5, 14 to 16, I've included these um, verses that were written quite a time afterwards, but possibly included in this chapter just to show Nehemiah's different approach. So moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be the governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lauded it over the people. But out of reverence to God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any arms. So he basically gives a bit of a personal testimony about, you know, me and my family are lending money and grain to the needy as well, but we're not robbing people. He showed an opposite approach by opening his dinner table every evening to feed those in the community and he didn't use his power and position to get what he was entitled to. He was actually entitled to tax the people, 
and get a certain amount of food and expenses and things, but he just, that's what the previous governors have done, but he just showed a very different way of leadership. So this just makes his arguments about what's going on and about the exhaustion that was going even more compelling because he showed in his own behaviour and way of living that he didn't live like that. And in verse 15, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. So he had a deep reverence for God and a concern for the welfare of people. He was a man of deep integrity in that he lived what he preached. And it really shows to me about his unselfish leadership, showing mercy, service and generosity. And he feared God and acted compassionately. I'm sure you can relate to this in our world today, that there's a desperate need for this kind of compassion and service amongst our leaders but also amongst us in society. You know, about how we deal with the needy, whether it's poor, the disabled, elderly, orphan, drug addicts, hospitalized, the dying. How do we deal with injustices in the system? Are we living like the entitled Jews and panicking when the bolts on the economy tighten up, taking money from where we can, looking after ourselves, or do we trust God, whether we have a little or a lot? As it says in Proverbs 11, verse 28, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So maybe there's aspects of Nehemiah's leadership style that you could work on, whether it's a situation in the workplace, at school, in your family, wherever it happens to be. Do we need to confront an injustice? Maybe in our family, in a workplace, in our community. Or, you know, maybe we need a righteous anger or passion in us again, have we become impassive and numb to what's happening, which is very easy to do, you can just become overwhelmed and overloaded. If someone comes to us with a grievance or issue about us personally or a work issue or something, how do we respond? Are we defensive or compassionate? Do we deal with it head on or hope it will go away on its own? And are we prepared to make ourselves vulnerable or unpopular, potentially, with some people by the decisions we might have to make? Are we filled with mercy, hope and patience to do whatever the latest battle is for us? And do we keep the end goal in sight? Or do we just let, let ourselves sink in and just think, oh, here we go again, you know, that kind of feeling, and just lose your hope about what the end goal is? So there's lots of things to think about there, there's lots of different avenues where your thoughts might be taking you, there might be something that struck you personally as needing to work on. Um, I know personally for me, I think I have become like overwhelmed and, and numb to what's going on in the world. You know, it's kind of just like, oh, here we go, you know. It's almost like you've just heard it so much, you, you kind of lose that passion and motivation to make a difference um, and to try and do something. Um, so while we're, we're just going to have a song, which Nick's going to play for us. This song came to mind when I was planning this talk, just because I think the words are really beautiful, but also it reminds me of what Nehemiah was like, um, being gracious and compassionate. So we're going to have the Lord is gracious and compassionate. And um, if you just want to be reflecting, praying, and thinking about what you want to bring to God, um, that'd be great.
Um, but it's kind of having to still trust in God and have that hope and still fight on, you know, even you could be so close to whatever it is that you wanted to change and yet it feels like a million years away or it's never going to happen. Uh, so I particularly just want to pray for those people, if there's anyone here that that speaks to. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you will come now and just give us that confidence and hope in you that doesn't come from ourselves, it comes from from you purely, it's like a completely supernatural thing that comes over us. So we have the confidence and strength to face another day and to possibly another battle, another difficulty, but keeping the end goal in sight and, and taking from Nehemiah about how he dealt with things compassionately, calmly, but still kept the end goal and kept pressing on throughout the difficulties. So I just pray, Lord, that you will break down those walls that we may have built up in our hearts against you, where we struggle to connect with you and just think, it's just too much, I can't go on anymore. I just pray, if there's anyone here that is feeling like that, that they will just open up to you and open up to somebody here that they can get prayer and healing from that and um, restoration and hope. Amen.